looking through the word and reading through the Psalms, and I came across David, a man that uh, a man that is after God's heart. And I can see why this man was after God's heart, because this man loved God. He loved God. And because he loved God, he was a man of prayer. He's a man that prayed, and he cried out to God. He had so much trouble and struggle in life, and it didn't hinder him from praying. It didn't stop him from praying. He cried the more out to God when trials and tests and trouble and affliction come. Let's, let's look at a few verses here in Psalm 6. And I'm going to start at verse 4. And he's saying, return, O Lord, rescue my soul. Save me because of your loving kindness. We're here this morning, nothing that we have done, nothing good that we have done, but because of his loving kindness. That storm that was heading this way, it was because of his loving kindness. I pray, say, Lord God, I pray, turn that storm from whence it came. Let it go back into the sea. That's where it need to go. We don't need to hear on land, Lord God, because we know we are, not, we, we are just flesh. David says we're no more than a grain of sand on the seashore before God. Nothing. We need him. So God, he heard our prayer. And that storm went back. All we had was rain. Thank be to God. I have not heard anything about anyone losing any life. Only lose the material things of life. That can be replaced. But life cannot be replaced. If you are in Christ, your life will be, re- will be restored. Amen? So it, it, is, it is because of God's loving kindness where we're here this morning. Nothing, we, nothing good that we have done. No. Let, let us not get our heads swollen here. But it's God's mercy and grace that has kept us through the storm, through the rain. Through everything he has kept us. For there is no mention of you in death. That's what he's saying, David is saying. In show, who will give you thanks? Who will give you thanks, Lord, if I'm dead? When you're, when you're gone or when, when the saints go to sleep, we don't praise God no more. We don't worship. We don't pray no more because we are at rest. Amen? So now is the time. To praise him. Now is the time to pray. Now is the time to seek his faith. Now is the time. He says, I am weary with my sign every night. I make my bed to swim. That means this man was a man that cried and he prayed. Yes. Many times we have to cry. Sometimes we don't cry when we're praying. But when the time gets tough and hard, it, it, it will lead us to a place where we have to cry out to God and weep before God with much, in, you know, with, with much earnestness. I am weary with my sign. Every night I make my bed to swim. I dissolve my couch with my tears. They would cry out to God in the time of his struggle, in the time of hardship. He cry out to God because he knows that God is the only one that can help. There's no other source. There's no other power. Only God is the only power. Amen. Listen, saints, the devil know that, um, that, that prayer is powerful. The devil know that your faith is powerful. The devil know that your love, my God, will drive away fear. My God. So he, he, the weapons of our warfare, then they're not carnal saints, but they're mighty through God. Much prayer, fervent prayer, my God, will a detour the enemy. The enemy don't want you to pray because he know the power of prayer. He don't want you to have strong faith because he knows strong faith move mountain. So he will hinder you from being strong in your faith. He will turn your way. He will cause you to be weak in faith. But God wants us to have strong faith. God wants us to love him and love people because perfect love casts out fear. The, the enemy don't want you to work these 
these powerful weapons that we have. Amen? Because he knows that what prayer will do. He knows what faith will do. He knows what the love of God in us will do. It will cast away fear. It will drive away fear. My God, he knows that. So he will try his very best to intimidate you not to pray, not to hold on to your faith, not to love God and love people because you know, my God, these weapons are mighty and powerful through God. Let's look, let us go to James chapter 5. Elijah, as the Lord says, men that always pray and faint not. He said, pray lest we fall into temptation. My God, prayer will drive back temptation. If you're praying, temptation, my God, won't take you off guard. It won't, it, it, it won't creep upon you because, because of prayer, you will see. It. Because of your strong faith, you will see. It. Because of the love they have for God, you will see the temptation and flee. Amen? Elijah said in, 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 in um, James chapter 5, I think it's verse 17. Elijah, he says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, just like us. Just like us. He's just a man, just like us. And it says, and he prayed earnestly. Pray earnestly. I mean, this man was steadfast in his prayer. He didn't let up on his prayer. He kept on praying, kept on praying. Until he see result. He did not give up. Saints, we can't let the things of this life. We can't let affliction and sickness and whatever come our way. We can't let because our back is against the wall that we are going to give up on prayer. Now is the time to press in prayer. Now is time to hold on to your faith. Let your faith be strong. Let your love in God be perfect. Because it will drive back fear. My God, Elijah prayed. He was just a man just like us, but he prayed because God is a God that will hear and answer prayer. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. What a man. That man prayed. Saints, we got to have a, 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 a heart to pray like Elijah. You know, pray. I'm here here today, not because of my goodness, but because God encouraged me and stirred my heart to pray, to press in prayer. I remember many times I'm afflicted and down and out, and all I could do was pray, saints. All I knew to do was pray. I couldn't turn to my wife. I couldn't turn to my children. No, all I could turn to is God who is able. Oh, God, I turn to God who can comfort my soul. Because in him I live and move and walk and have my being. He is the source of my life and the strength of my life. He is the keeper of my soul. He promised never to leave me nor forsake me. So I press. Saints, we got to press. Because God's God said not leave you. He won't leave you. He's there. My God, I heard the song. I said, he's there all the time. He's there all the time. Waiting, my God. He's waiting. He's waiting. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So Elijah prayed earnestly. For three and a half years, he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. Then he prayed again. And the sky poured rain. And the hurt produced saying uh, this encouraged me that if I keep on praying it gonna rain it will rain and it gonna produce fruit saints let us be steadfast let us be an always be an unremovable let us stand listen saints let your prayer be earnest let your faith be strong, solid, like a rock. And let your love of God become perfect because fear will have to go. Saints, I encourage you, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Saints, put on the whole armor of God after you don't understand. Stand. Don't let nobody cause you to quiver. Amen. Stand, saints, stand. Because these are the last day. Many are falling along the wayside. 
Many have given up. I've seen all the saints have fallen along the wayside, but it's not time to give up because Jesus Christ is nearer than when we first believed. Amen? Saints, please take the word of God with you. Meditate on it. Apply it and do it. And God will bless you in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Tell your neighbor, stand. Scriptures say when you've done all else, stand. Anybody ever feel like you're at that place? I kind of feel like that recently. When, when we've done everything else that we know to do, just stand and see. Isn't that what the Old Testament tells us? Stand still and see the salvation of our God. We can't save ourselves. We have to stand with expectation towards God, who God will give us power. God will deliver us. God will bring salvation. Tell somebody else, stand this morning. Stand firm. Amen? We, we talk much about uh, the difference between the carnal mind and the spiritual mind. And I, I think one of the greatest discrepancies that we have as Christians, is our thoughts, our minds, in a lot of ways, are simply not in alignment with God's mind. And I'm not even, I'm not talking about intelligence, I'm not talking about wisdom, I'm not talking about understanding. I'm talking about in the simple things. I'm talking about God is thinking of situations differently than we are. Right? He sees the circumstances of our lives. We're looking at the circumstances of our lives. But we have a very different perspective of what we're going through than what God, God's perspective is of what we're going through. That's one of the differences between the carnal mind and the spiritual mind is we've got to come into alignment with God's perspective, that higher perspective, that higher mindset. He sees things from a completely different vantage point than we do. If we look at things through the carnal mind with just emotions, with just our eyes, with just our feelings, all we'll ever see is depth and despair, depths and despair, discouragement, depression, but when God looks at our same set of circumstances, God doesn't get depressed. God doesn't get discouraged. It's not that God's seeing something different. He's looking at the same set of circumstances that you and I are looking at. He just has a completely different viewpoint than what we have. So then our goal must become, God, reveal your mind to me. I've got to change how I'm thinking about my current circumstance to come into alignment with how God is thinking concerning my circumstance, right? Does that make sense? With that in mind, I want to ask you this question. Close your eyes, if you will. And I want you to think, and I'm not asking this about you as an individual. I'm getting ready to ask this question about us corporately as a church, as the body of Christ as a whole. Not only this local assembly, but the body of Christ as a whole worldwide. All right? Here, here's the question. How does Christ view us? How does Christ view the church in our generation? You can open your eyes. There is no possible way for us to answer that question simply. Because when I look at the church, I see a mess. I see a lot of foolishness going on. In the name of Christ. A lot of people using the principles of Christ. The teachings of Christ to exploit others. We see a lot of abuse. We see a lot of hypocrisy. We, we see a lot of things. When Christ looks at the church. He sees the same exact circumstances that we are seeing. 
but he sees it from a very different perspective than we see it. And I feel like he thinks about it somewhat differently than we do. That doesn't mean he overlooks the foolishness. It just means that his perspective trumps the foolishness. It's greater than the foolishness. Here's what I mean by that. Turn with me to the book of Ephesians chapter number 5. And I want to read the last part of this, this passage here. And most times when this passage is read in church, it's read from the context of marriage. As it should be. That's one of the points that Paul is trying to get across in Ephesians chapter 5 starting with verse 22. But I think there's something deeper going on here as well. And that's what I want to bring out this morning. I want to bring this out from a different perspective, from a different viewpoint. I want to look at this through Christ's eyes. Can you do that? Tell your neighbor, we're going to look at this through Jesus' eyes. Watch this, Ephesians 5, Paul writes to the church, to us, to saints. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. Somebody say amen or oh me. One or the other. It's in there, written as plain as day. Wives, subject yourselves to your own husbands just like you would submit to the Lord himself. It's powerful, right? For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ also. Now watch this. The husband is the head of the wife as Christ also is the head of the, the church. He himself being the savior of the body. Well, who's the body? Scripture tells us we are the body of Christ. And Christ is the savior of the body. And because Christ was willing to give his own life, he paid a price to purchase the church with his own blood. So Christ now, because he is the savior of the body, has also by God been made the head of the church. So Christ is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body, verse 24. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Nobody wants to hear this stuff. This is not a modern message. This is not aligned with feminism. It, te it literally teaches the wife is to subject herself to the husband and treat him just like she would Jesus. If Jesus came to you and said, I want you to do it this way, are you going to whine and gripe and complain and bicker? And... Right? Right? Just said, God, tight. <laughs> Ooh. Watch this. I'm going to get off the wives in a minute. I'm gonna get, get on the husbands. We always do. The husbands got a role in this as well. But no, 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 no. Don't skip yet. I wanna, I'm still on this verse. But as the church is subject to Christ. Now, we live in a society where obviously wives are not subjected to their husbands not not at all. We try to, our our society tries to complete to paint a completely different image of what a marriage looks like other than what the scriptures teach. But we know that doesn't work. We proved that doesn't work. The only way marriage work it works is to do it God's way. That's the only way marriage will ever work. Because God created the man and the woman with our bodies, with our mentalities, with our hormones. He made us the way that we were to work in this way. And if we try to switch roles, it's never going to work. Neither person will ever be happy in a relationship like that. They'll never find the peace and the joy and the comfort that God designed for us inside of a godly marriage when we fulfill our God-given roles. That's the only way that joy, that peace, that enjoyment can come. The world tries to give us a generic version of marriage. But why is it that when we look to society, even in the church, even in the church now, we see that wives are not submitted to their husbands? Why is that? Because the image... The, the wife is supposed to pattern herself after the church. And if the church 
refuses to subject itself and does whatever it wants to do, ignores his commandments, disobeys his commandments, disobeys his teaching, then the church is living in rebellion against Christ. So then when the women, the wives in the church look towards their husbands, they now treat their own husbands with the same example that the church itself with the same spirit that is upon the modern church. So goes the modern church family. If the church itself is living in rebellion to its husband, then it makes it super easy for that spirit to be passed on down that the the modern wife live in rebellion to her husband. Spirit. Spirits are being imparted. People are making choices and they're they're not even thinking about things from this deep of a level. But we see the fruit of it manifested all over. Christianity in our times. Ideally, what Christ intended, what God intended for the church to function is that the church would subject itself to its husband, to Christ, in everything. For he's the head. He's the Savior. That's what the previous verse just told us. Because he is the Savior of the body, he has been made head over us. So the church then is is compelled, should be compelled... By the Holy Spirit that is within us, we should be compelled to want to obey and subject ourselves to everything that Christ teaches us. If that is not the spirit within the church, the spirit is not being led by, the church is not being led by the Holy Spirit of God. Because remember Christ said when the Holy Spirit is given, the Holy Spirit is going to do what? Testify of of me. So if you're being led by the Holy Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit is going to constantly point you to Christ. The Spirit will teach you to subject yourself to Christ. To obey everything that Christ taught. Jesus went as far as to say, if if you forget, disciples, if you forget what I've taught you, don't worry. The Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance whatsoever things I've taught you that you've even forgot. The Holy Spirit will move upon you to remind you, oh no, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said "We we need to do this here. Think about that. So the Holy Spirit of God, the power of God, the nature of God, the character of God, the anointing of God has been put in our hearts for what purpose? To empower us to serve Christ. Empower us to submit to Jesus Christ and his teachings. That's deep. But as the church is subject to Christ, that that is the role of the church is to subject itself to Christ. So also the wives ought to be to their own husbands in everything. Verse 25. Watch this. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also Love the church. Well, how much did Christ love the church? What example of loving your bride did Jesus give? He gave himself up for her. He sacrificed his wants, his desires. Right? Even Jesus himself prayed in that moment of anguish. Father, I pray that this cup pass from me. Do you realize what would have happened to us? If that prayer would have been answered, if God would have allowed that cup, that pain, that suffering for Christ not to have to endure, and Christ didn't deserve to endure it. He lived pure, he lived holy, he lived righteous before God. If anyone had a right to pray that prayer and it be answered, it was Jesus. Yet, 
before God even had to make an, a, a choice to answer that prayer or not, Jesus followed it up with, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And what was the will of God? The will of God was that Christ must need suffer and die so that many sons could be brought into the kingdom through the death of one obedient man. Many would be made righteous. So Christ loved the church so much that he, we talked about it a couple of weeks ago. What is love? You remember? If you haven't give, you haven't loved. Words are not love. To truly love, we must give something. And he exemplified perfect love. He so loved his bride, his wife, that he gave himself up. Not for himself. He did it for, for her. Well, who is her? Put your finger in your chest. He did that for us. He did that for you. That's how much he loved us. That he gave himself up for us. That we wouldn't have to pay the penalty for our sins. No greater love has any man than this. That a man lay down his life for his, for his friends. No greater love. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Verse 25, 26. So that, watch this. He didn't just, he didn't just give up his life and marry himself to us and stop there. He had a purpose in mind. He married us for a reason. What was that reason? That he might sanctify her. Well, who is her? Me. Male or female? Speaking proverbially, allegorically, we are her. I am her. You are her. He, he did this that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, talking about baptisms, and what he taught. Everything that Christ taught, what was he doing? His word was meant to wash the minds of everyone who was sin sick, everyone who was hurting, everyone who was a slave to sin. Christ walked into the middle of our bondage and said, I want to marry you. All right, man, don't raise your hand. But how many of you have, have intent? You, you, I don't want to get too graphic. How many of you men, when you went to pick a wife for yourself, walked down to the local prostitute hangout and picked the one with the most STDs and said, I want to marry you. I want to heal you. I want to commit... I, I love you so much that I am literally going to give my own life so that you might continue to live. And throughout all of this, I'm going to deliver you from, every, you're in poverty right now, you can't make ends meet, but I'm going to, I'm going to adopt you into the kingdom of my father. I'm going to put a robe on you. I'm going to give you treasures. I'm going to give you wisdom. I'm going to give you riches. I'm going to reveal the mysteries of the kingdom of God to you. That's exactly what Jesus has done. 
for every single one of us. And by his teachings and by the spirit that we have received, by the water we have been baptized into now the body of Christ. We have become the bride of Christ and now his purpose. Christ is looking at us this morning as his bride. You Remember I asked you how is Christ viewing us? Christ is viewing the church as his bride that he purchased with his own blood. That he has been working feverishly to sanctify her and cleanse her by the washing of the, the by the washing of water and by the word. He's been speaking to the church, trying to get the church prepared, trying to bring the church out of its problems, out of its bondages, out of its foolishness, out of its hypocrisy. He is ever reaching to sanctify his bride. And many of the bride have no issue. They have no, in, no they have no interest in responding to the call of the lover of their soul and allowing him to wash them of the foolishness and the hypocrisy and the unrighteousness. But there are some. And every man has to choose for himself. Every woman has to choose for him, herself. When Christ looks at the church, he looks at his bride that's what he sees when we look at the church we see some of we see many different things some of us see a business when some people look at the church that's all they see is dollar signs that's all they see is a business based on religion but their their alignment their vision their mindset is severely out of whack and out of tune with how God and Christ view the church. We view the church as like an option. Just a hobby. It's, it's just something I do on Sunday mornings. And if I'm feeling really committed, Wednesday nights. It's, that's our viewpoint. Right? Viewpoint is something I do. It's somewhere I go. It's, it, it's like a club. It's like a... But is that how Christ is viewing? The same group of people that Christ is looking at, he sees them from a very different viewpoint. He sees them as his bride. He loves them so much, he sees them as his own body. Watch this, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Watch as this continues, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory. Not in her foolishness, not in her unrighteousness. He's working to purge her, to sanctify her, that he might be able to present to himself a chaste bride, having no spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. Christ is looking at us today saying, I want to marry you, but I need you to clean some things up. I need you to get ready. I need you to let me prepare you for the marriage supper of the Lamb, the marriage of Christ to the church. Watch this, verse 28. So husbands, so husbands ought to, ought to all, all, also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. That is, that is some of the greatest wisdom in this entire passage. When somebody's like, but I don't really feel like loving her today. Well, you know what you do when you love her? 
I'm not, no, I don't think my wife really appreciates this term. So close your ears, dear. <laughs> Stick your fingers in your ears. Anybody ever heard the term happy wife, happy life? It's very much true, right? I think the opposite of that is also true. Nobody wants to live with a miserable man either, right? Truth. So we can draw a truce here. Happy wife, happy life, happy husband, happy life. It, the, the key is make someone else happy. Give yourself to someone else. And whatever you give to someone else shall come back to you. Press down, shaken together, running over. That's the principle. That's scriptural principles. When we give love away, love comes back to us like a flood. He's teaching that same thing in marriage here. If you love your wife, she's going to love you back. So husbands ought to love their wives just like you love your own body. Watch this. 29. For no one, no one ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ also does the church. You see the parable he's, he's drawing for us here? Nobody walks around except people who are mentally unstable. Mentally, people who are mentally unstable, even those who are demon-possessed, will cut themselves, will harm themselves, will hurt themselves. Someone has to be mentally unstable or demon-possessed to hurt themselves. But nobody in their right mind walks, wakes up one morning and says, you know what, I think I'll just smash myself with a hammer today. Let me put my thumb out there and hit it as hard as I can. Wow! Right, when's the last time you did that? Let me bust out my, my, my butcher's knife today and just slice my arm wide open and see how much blood I can drain onto my kitchen counter. Right? When did you do that? Sane people don't do that type of, that type of stuff. Why? Nobody hates his own flesh. But we do everything. Listen, if I get around a sharp knife, what I'm thinking is, man, where is, the, where is a case to put, the, where is a drawer to slide this thing in? Before I stick my finger in a drawer, I'm looking to see exactly how every knife is lined out. Because if I just reach in there hastily and snatch one out, I'll cut myself by accident. So I take care. What's going on in here? Before I stick my flesh... In that drawer, I want to have a good grip and understanding of what's going on in here. Right? Because I'm doing what? Nourishing my fingers. Cherishing my fingers. Valuing my health. Valuing my ability to not be hurt. But Christ didn't view his physical body like that. He viewed us as his own physical body. And instead of nourishing and cherishing his flesh, he gave up his flesh to nourish and cherish what was even more valuable to him. You. So he has done everything that he possibly can to nourish and to cherish the church. Even while she's slicing herself open. He's showing love. He's showing mercy. He's showing grace. He's trying to sanctify her, sanctify her from incorrect mindsets that are causing her to harm herself. And she doesn't even realize it. Yet he views her with eyes of love. Somebody say the church. The church. Just as Christ also nourishes and cherishes the church. Watch this, verse 30. Because... 
we are members because he viewed us as his wife and he gave himself and we were born into his kingdom because of his love towards us. Now we, Christ views us as his own body. We take church so casually. And Christ views it from such a very different perspective. He views this body of people in Raleigh, North Carolina, he views us as his wife. He views us as his own. It goes deeper than that. He views us as his own body. And he is working to nourish and to cherish and to keep us from harming ourselves. So that he may be able to present to himself ultimately a bride that doesn't have a spot, that doesn't have a blemish, that doesn't have a wrinkle. That's his goal for us. Because we are members of his body. Give me that next verse. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become. What This verse is an Old Testament prophecy out of Isaiah. It's, it's literally quoting Isaiah here. But notice the dynamic that is now being applied to. Christ left his father in heaven. He left his father, and he was joined to his wife, and the two... Christ and the church shall become one flesh, one body, one mind thinking the thoughts and one body carrying the thoughts out. Not two minds, not two wheels, not two purposes. One single purpose. Christ left his father, joined his wife, and the two have now, should have become, he's working that it may become one flesh. That's how he views us. That's how he views Tekor. As a part of his body, his bride who has become so close to him that she literally has been melded into his his own body, they have become. He desires for us to become one. The two become one flesh. That's how Christ views us. Watch this. This mystery is great. But I am speaking, this, this mystery is great. Somebody say, yes, being married is a great mystery. It's a, it's a mystery to find out happy marriage, right? It's unsolved mysteries. Anybody remember that old show back in the day? It scared me to death when I was a little boy trying to go to bed. So unsolved mysteries. And people look at the mystery, like, like marriage is an unsolved. Marriage is not an unsolved mystery. It's been solved. People just don't want to do what Jesus said to do to fix it. Right? Don't want to pay that price. The mystery is great, but watch this. The mystery is not even referring to human marriages. He's using the, the relationship between Christ and the church to teach how a human marriage should function. But the ultimate goal of this passage is not to teach marriage. It's to teach Christ and the church. This mystery is great. But I am speaking with reference to like, yeah, I'll teach you how to be married, but that's secondary. What I really want you to get out of this is how that Christ views the church. How does he view it? It's his bride. He gave everything for you. He gave everything for this local assembly. 
When Christ looks at Tekor, what does he see? That's my bride. I fear that many times we approach, I've done it in the past. In, in the past, I've had that same mentality. And that mentality was so incongruent with what Christ had, the mentality of Christ. We view church as, like I said, a club, a hobby, something that I do from time to time. But until our mentality comes into complete alignment with the mentality of Christ concerning the church, we will continue to struggle. We have got to come to the revelation that Christ views us as his bride and loved her so much that he became one with her, that she literally became his body. He is the head. We are the body. Give me Ephesians 2, verse 17. And he, speaking of Jesus, came and preached peace to you. Somebody say that's me. Who was far away and peace to them who were near. He came and he preached peace. Verse 18. For though we have both our access. For, I'm sorry. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. Because of what Christ did, and only through what Christ did, we have access to the Father. That's powerful. So then, verse 19, we are no longer strangers and aliens, right? But, but when we view one another in the church... When we look at one another, we can easily slip into that mentality of dealing with one another as strangers and aliens. Right? Because even in a church, the flesh kicks in and we start clicking with people who think like we do, act like we do, have the same political viewpoints that we do. We huddle around a number of carnal-minded issues and then we view the rest of the body of Christ like they are Strangers and aliens. But they're not strangers and aliens. Not in Christ's eyes. In Christ's eyes, they are just as much bride as you are. So then, because of what Christ did, gave us access to the Father, so then we are no longer strangers and aliens, but we are fellow citizens we we literally changed citizenship we are no longer we are no longer pilgrims and strangers in this world but we seek a better country a country whose builder a city whose builder and maker is god we changed citizenship we are fellow citizens with the saints and are of god's household God sent his son to marry a bride to increase his household. What is the household of God? Everything that God created. God created the angels. Certain angels left their abode and are no longer a part of the household of God, the kingdom of God. But yet there are still myriads of angels who stand around the throne and praise God at all times, worshiping Him. They are the household of God. Now, we who were once alienated from God, who, who had nothing to offer but what this life itself gave us, which was not much, 
God so loved us before we even knew he existed, he so loved us that he sent his only begotten son to marry us. To bring us out of our foolishness, to sanctify, to cleanse us, to adopt us and bring us back to the house of God. That we may be sons and daughters of God. Think about that. Think about that relationship. We view the church so casually. But God views the church with such value as daughters. He literally allowed his son to be killed that you could be adopted into his household and be a part of his family. Brother Emmanuel, can we, can we stop that? That's very distracting. Thank you. So then we are no longer strangers and aliens, but we are fellow citizens with the saints, adopted into another country and are a part of now God's own family. That's what household means. It's referring to family. God's own family. Watch this as this continues. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets... Christ Jesus being the cornerstone. Now now it's likening us to being a house built for God. We've been built on the foundation of apostles and prophets. Christ himself is the chief cornerstone. But we are the bricks that are built on top of that. So line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, there is being built up a dwelling place for God himself. In whom, verse 21... In whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into, it's growing into a holy temple in the Lord. So God is constantly growing his temple brick by brick. Look at your neighbor and tell him it's good to see you this morning, brickhead. Right? Humorous. But it's, there's an element of truth to it. I'm not, you're not dumb as a brick. That's not what I'm trying to say. But I'm saying each one of you are a brick. Every single one of us whom God has dealt with and by his mercy has brought us to this place. Every single one of us were a brick in the hand of Christ. And he is building a house for God. In whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. In whom you also are being built together. You also are being built. So many people view their relationships with God as individualistic. Like it's just you and God. It's not just you and God. That's what the whole New Testament is trying to tell us. We are God doesn't build anybody as an individual. What he's doing in your life as an individual is for a greater purpose than you yourself. If God is anointing you as an individual, guess why? He's preparing you to be placed in your place so that somebody else could find support in you and they could find their place in the kingdom of God because of your gifting and your anointing. But we don't view it that way. We don't understand. We don't have the same mentality that Christ has concerning the church. His mentality is in whom also you are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. A dwelling of God in the Spirit. Verse 23. That's it. It's the end of the chapter. Okay. All right. Herod's temple. Anybody remember reading about it? Have you read about it lately? Maybe never. I don't know how many of us actually read the Old Testament. But First First Chronicles talks about the temple that Solomon built. And the glory of God came down because it was so, the worship was so sincere. And the 
the physical features of the temple were so impressive. It took years, decades to build. And when, when, when they, they built it and they opened it and they worshipped in it for the first time, the glory of God came down in such a magnificent way. Now, I want you to picture yourself. I want you to picture yourself grabbing a uh, sledgehammer and walking up while they're having this ceremony, while the glory of God is falling fresh in this building, and you just start hacking away at the temple. <laughs> How long do you think you would live? Because these people were serious about their temple. Somebody would have put an arrow right through your temple before you got the second hit in. Probably the first. Right? Yet, when it comes to the New Testament temple, we don't have a problem busting our sledgehammer out and attacking one of those specific bricks in the kingdom of God and just hammering away at it without mercy, without grace, without forgiveness. Just We would respect a physical building much more than we respect a spiritual building that God himself is working to create. Watch, watch this. Watch how you say, well, that's, that's Old Testament. You know, God, it, God, didn't, God didn't like that right there anymore. 1 Corinthians 3. Anybody know where 1 Corinthians is? New Testament or Old Testament? New Testament. Watch this. 1 Corinthians 3 and 16. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Watch this, 17. If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy and that is what you are the temple of God and yet we're so quick to break out our sledgehammers and hack away at God's precious and holy temple we better be careful how we speak of God's people. We may not agree with them on everything. We may have differences in opinion that by the spirit, by the unity of the faith, we've not been brought together to the same understanding yet. But that's supposed to be the entire purpose of the church is unifying itself in preparation for the, being presented to Christ without spot and without blemish. We're in this life to prepare ourselves to iron out the wrinkles. But instead of ironing out wrinkles, a lot of times we're hammering away at one another. Trying to act like they're not a part of the body of Christ. Well, who makes that judgment? Remember I told you when we were teaching on love, anyone who loves is born of God. That's a powerful statement. To me, at the very least, what that means is somebody who has learned to love, you better not just write them off because they don't have all their doctrine right yet. Because at the very least, God is doing something in their life. And how can I cut off someone whom God has received and God is working and moving in their life, even if they don't have the level of truth that I have yet? And such a freedom to do things comes because we don't really understand. We don't view the church through Christ's eyes. It's his bride. It's his body. Y'all are bored, so I'm going to have to hurry. Give me Ephesians 1. In verse... I'm going to read from verse 1 just because I can. It's good.
Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God to the... Somebody say, that's me. The bride, the body, who are at Ephesus. He's speaking to a specific group of people, but the principles that he gives them are entirely universal principles to every church. So he's writing to the saints who are faithful in Christ Jesus, verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father and the Son. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice, blessed be God who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places What is that statement reiterating? The point that because of what Christ has done, because Christ married us, we now have been accepted into the house of God because Christ is the Son of God. And when the Son takes a wife, the wife now becomes also a part of the Father's family. That's what that verse is telling us. Because of what Christ did, God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Now watch this, verse 4. Just as He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. In love. Verse 5, watch this. In love. We've been talking about love. It's the key to everything. It's the key to getting a revelation of the church itself. If you don't understand love, you won't ever be able to love the church as the bride of Christ. It's not just a place we come on Sunday morning. It's a family. It's a body. It's the bride of Christ. And we've got to cherish it to the same level that Christ cherishes the church. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention somebody say God's got a will God's got a plan remember every brick boom every brick every brick is building up the ultimate fulfillment of the plan of God you are a small piece in an eternal plan that God foreordained and had in his mind before the world was ever created. He had you in mind. Knowing that in the year 2018, I'll place another brick in my plan. Watch this. Go to, go to chapter 3, Ephesians 3. And start with verse 8. To me, Paul writing, the very least of all saints. Notice how Paul viewed himself in conjunction with everybody else. Like if anybody had a right to be puffed up and arrogant, it was Paul. With all the revelation and understanding and wisdom that God gave to him, the ways that God used Paul. But yet Paul viewed himself as, I'm the very least of all the saints. This grace, this grace, which is unmerited favor, which means I didn't deserve it, yet he gave it to me anyway. This grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ, the inheritance that we have because we've married Christ. We married into money. We married into riches. We had nothing. We came from nothing. And Christ so chose every one of us that he married you into spiritual riches. To preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. Watch this, verse 9. And to bring to light what is the administration of the... We talked about that in Ephesians 5. The mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created 
So God has been working on this master plan through ages and those, even the prophets who were some of the foundational stones, couldn't enjoy the benefits. Hebrews 11 tells us about this. That they looked into these things and they rejoiced in God but they would never be able to experience it for themselves because they were out of time. But God used them in their place. And they knew they were working to lay a foundation for a people who would receive the benefit And God just let them spiritually catch a glimpse of it. And they were satisfied with that. And to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things. God's been working on this plan. Now watch this. Watch verse 10. So that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through The church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. God worked all throughout the Old Testament to build himself a building. And because... And and inside that building, he has hid his wisdom. And now he desires in our generation, in this covenant, God is desiring that the church show forth that wisdom. This This is so deep and there's a million different ways that I can go with this. When the world looks to the church, I'm going to suffice to say this, when the world looks to the church, they shouldn't be seeing foolishness and hypocrisy and division and bickering and a lack of love and unrighteousness and lust. They can look around in their own world, their own families, their own lives and see all of that they ever want to see. But the work that God is trying to do is he's trying to get us to get a revelation of who we are. That as a corporate group, we are the the place where the mysteries of God, the wisdom of God is hid inside the church. The solution to every problem this world faces is hid in the church. How do we overcome racism? The answer is in obeying the commandments of Christ, allowing him to sanctify our own minds of traditions, of past hurts, of past wrongs, of wrong ideas, of wrong concepts, and allowing him to so cleanse us that when we look at a brother or sister in this building, we don't even see color anymore. That's the plan of God. That's what God's trying to do in us. And in doing that, God has hid his wisdom in the church. And if the church can ever get it together, and if the church can iron out the wrinkles, and if the church can get rid of the spots on its own garments then we become the manifestation of God's wisdom to the earth. And the mystery of God's wisdom is no longer hid anymore. But it is manifested through the church so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church. The church is not a hobby. It's not something you do on a Sunday morning and sometimes Wednesday night. The church is the bride of Christ. And he so loved it that he bought it with his own blood. And now he counts it to be his own body. And he nourishes it. And he cherishes it. 
And God now looks because of what Christ did for us. And God accepts us into his own family, into his own kingdom. And says, that is where I want to hide my wisdom. That's where I want to invest my power. That's where I want to put my strength. That's where I want to manifest myself to the entire world. I'm going to do it through, through the church. Come on, stand with me right now. Let's lift our hands. Father, we open our hearts and we open our minds today. And we pray, God, let this word be a revelation to us. Reveal to me, oh God, your perspective. Reveal to me how you view us. How that Christ views us. I know we're messed up. I know we're divided. I know we've partaken in all kinds of foolishness and unrighteousness. But God, I feel your mercy. And I feel your love. Flowing down through Christ Jesus. And he is drawing us to him. He is drawing us to Him. And God, every life in this building right now is just another brick in your plan. And you've been working for centuries, oh God, creating yourself a dwelling place. And your ultimate plan, Father... Is that your wisdom and your power and your might and your love would be manifested to this world through this church. Change us today, Father. Change me, God. Forgive me, Father, for viewing the church in incorrect ways, not valuing it as you do, Father. Help me view it today, Father, in your terms, through your perspective. To value it as you do, Father. To value my brothers and sisters beside of me. For one brick by itself accomplishes nothing. The only thing a brick is good for is to be joined to other bricks. Its entire purpose is to be connected with somebody else that an ultimate plan and an ultimate purpose be fulfilled. Here I am today, God, realizing I am least of all the saints. And I am nothing without being connected to each and every one of them. For whatever you're going to do through us, it will never come as individuals. It will only come corporately. Help us realize today, Father, how connected we need to become to one another. That we may be built up a spiritual house, your temple, Father, where you can place and invest your wisdom and your love and your power in us as we join together in one mind and in one accord. Here we are, Father. Bind us together. Bind us together, oh God. With cords that cannot be broken. Father, move upon our hearts today. That we begin to look to the church. To see how we can get involved. How that we can be a blessing to the rest of your bride. To the rest of your body. How that we can become so joined with them. That when we, become, when we come together, we are so much more powerful. Because if one can put a thousand to flight, two can put ten thousand to flight. We multiply one another's giftings. God, deal with our hearts today. That we have more than just a a casual commitment to one another but that we start operating in love 
in a revelation of the body of Christ that we be fitly joined together and that every joint begin to supply what only it can supply that the rest of the body would be edified in love that your purpose be fulfilled in our generation that your purpose be fulfilled in our assembly God do this in take or here we are come on pray right now saints if you need to repent 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 if you need God to change your mentality about how you view the church ask him to do that right now commit to him as he's moving on your heart how to get more involved in the lives of your brothers and sisters let him speak to you right now and in the next few days to show you how to be connected how to be built up a spiritual house we seek you right now we humble ourselves we pray we seek your face we turn from every wicked way and every ungodly mindset and let revelation come upon us right now oh god in the name of jesus christ message this morning praise god just I want to be a faithful member of the body of Christ. And I was just thinking about being a, a brick. And how if you know if you, you lay brick straight up with mortar in between, it'll crack. They'll they'll fall apart. But you have to overlap them as you're building that wall. They're interlinked. That's the only way. And, and you know, I see storms come and I see older brick homes and the roofs may fly off. But you'll still, you'll still see brick walls standing. They, they can withstand so much more. If you just think about yourself like that, like a brick in the wall, think about what you're supporting. The ones that overlap above you, the ones beside you, the ones that are overlapping beneath you to help hold you up. Man, I think about that story in the Old Testament. Um of Moses when they were going against the Amalekites and uh, he had her and who was beside him? Joshua. Aaron. Wait a minute, I'm getting, I'm getting confused. But anyway, Moses, as long as he held the rod of God up in the air, they were able, God's people were able to prevail. But when he began to grow weary and he would drop his arms, they would come beside him and they would hold his hands up. Think about how powerful that is. If we get that concept in our mind, to be that to our brother or sister, when they're down and they're weak, to go and hold their hands up and be there to support them. Be that brick that is helping to support our brothers and sisters. Man, I've got to be that way. Thank you, Lord, for your word this morning. Thank, thank, thank you, Lord, for the lives and the minds that you have touched and healed. Those that you have forgiven this morning. Those that you have healed this morning. Praise God. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for teaching me true love. Hallelujah. Praise God. We give you praise. We give you honor. Hallelujah. Praise God.